we are so winging it right now. You don't even know how much we're winging it right now. You can see the usual uh, sort of placard waving its kind of uh, unsteady, vibratory way all across your computerized screen. You can hear the voice. You might be might even be able to hear some clicking sounds. You can see some stuff in the background. Then I guess you probably know already that this is... Wait, I got a cough. <coughs> Good old dry throat there, gang. <clears> throat> All right, enough of this bullshiz. It's me, Malcolm Tent, bringing you this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. Pew, pew, coming at you live every Wednesday on the ever-dreaded, ever-irrepressible, ever-irrepressible, yet so indispensable Facebook. Ugh. Where did that attack of dry throat come from? I don't know. Chad Cochran says, hey, buddy. To you, Chad. Thanks for tuning in. Alan Versapellis is in. Hello, Alan. Ah, let me get my larynx nice and lubricated here so I can talk to you people properly. <clears throat> busy, busy day here. I, I pretty much literally um, walked in the door and jumped right in the saddle here to bring a tent talks tune. So I am like in total go, go, go mode. Now it also looks like I'm a little bit crooked here. Let's see if I can get my uh, camera angle straightened out. This is live, kids. This is, um, as I am so fond of saying, in the true spirit of cable TV, we're keeping it alive here. Not only with my fabulous dumpster-dived backdrop. Not only with my all-improvised, on-camera, witty repartee. But also in the live technical adjustments we do right before your very eyes. Yes, this is video verate of the highest order. And let's zoom in a little bit. How do I zoom in? I move the camera on its tripod forward until it's just about falling off the desk. That's the way we do it here on 10 Talks Tunes. Pow, pow, pow. Woo! So yeah, I've been up and running around all day. Hello, Mike from Vancouver. Good to have you here. Um, I spent most of the day today in the studio. <clears throat> uh, getting, I got to sat at the feet. I get to, I got to sit at the feet of one of the old masters, a guy who, um, excuse me. Started, got started in radio in the 1950s and um, is a wizard with working with reel-to-reel -reel tape because one of my sidelines is digitizing analog to digital for people. I'll do, you know, I'll make, uh, I'll transfer a cassette to CD, uh, vinyl to thumb drive, you know, whatever it takes. And um, I had this one job that involved reel-to-reel -reel tapes that was beyond my skill set, so I went over to this guy's house and I just watched him slap that reel-to-reel, -reel, like 50-year-old reel, onto his super-duper player and just thread it with his eyes closed, basically. And uh, he made it play, he made it sing, he made it sound great. And I was there for hours just watching him do this and listening to the results, which were mighty fine. So as, as a result of that, I just had to zoom right over there from the studio to here to bring you 10 Talks Tunes. So, yeah, improvisatory to the maximum today. <clears throat> All right, well, there you just had the excuse segment of the show. Let's get right down to the gritty nitty, shall we? Let's check the bulletin board. Let's check the mailbox. And then let's get to today's hot topic on 10 Talks Tunes, which if you saw my earlier Facebook post, you know what it is. But if you didn't, I'll tell you in a couple of minutes. All right, the bulletin board. I'm not going to belabor this too much because I've been talking about these things every week for quite a while now. Next week, September 22nd and 23rd, the Devotional Devo Fan Gathering. I was just served notice that I am actually performing a set on Friday night. I am going on directly before the Fantastic Plastics. And if you don't know them, check them out. If you like Devo, if you like 80s New Wave, if you like bright neon colors and wild fright wigs and really awesome, heavy synthesizer dance music. Fantastic plastics, baby. And I'm going on right before them. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be reprising my set of 
unwanted Devo songs. So I'm going to have my sampler, my rhythm tracks, and an electric guitar cranked up really effing loud. So don't be mistaken, I've done plenty of solo acoustic shows, but not this time. It's going to be solo electric, and it's going to be pumped, pumped, and pumped. So that's happening. The week after that, the main event, the number one event on the social season calendar, Anti-Scene's 40th anniversary concert at the Ground Zero in Spartanburg. I need say no more. I need say no more. I'm driving straight from here to Cleveland and then from Cleveland to Charlotte. I'm willing to do it. I think you are willing to do it. Even if you don't know it, you are willing to travel great lengths and great distances, if needed, to see a literal once-in-a-lifetime event. Six lineups represented, including the current lineup. Who knows if it'll ever happen again. I'm an optimist, but I never say ever. After that, October... And I can't remember the date. That's why i got to keep doing this, man. October 8th. October 8th, the Counterweight Brewery is hosting Red Scroll Records Record Fair. I will be set up. I am selling off my personal collection. Tired of humping these records around. I'm tired of taking them out the basement, in the basement, out the basement, in the basement. I'm done with that. I don't want these records in my basement anymore. They're all going to have price tags. They're going to be offered at the Counterweight. What kind of stuff, you might ask? I'll show you a little random sampling here. I just got this one crate here. This is a random crate of stuff that I have been um, hoarding, mostly since the uh, 90s into the 2000s. What is this, a Ruination? Looks like an 8-inch record. I'm not even sure what it is. Ruination. Uh, let's, let's go right side up. This is just a sampling. I'm not going to show you everything. Here's a nice... No, nope, that is backwards. Here's a nice sealed Snapcase record from whenever it came out in the year 2000. I would just grab one of anything that looked even remotely interesting and keep it for myself because I'm a collector, you know? What is this? I don't even know what this is. Oh, Arthur Russell. Sealed Arthur Russell vinyl. I heard a couple of tracks of his that I liked a lot. Sealed Scream album. This is on uh, white vinyl from uh, 2008, I think is when that came out. Uh, seizure, the Almighty Seizure. Hey, Murray Gelman. You're watching now. You're seeing yourself. Don't worry. I have my own personal copy, which is not for sale. This is an extra. Uh, what do we got here? Some sealed sheer terror. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I've been hauling around. This is my 401k. And I have many crates. This is just the R, one of the R and S crates. Counterweight Brewery, October 12th. Cheshire, Connecticut. If I don't sell them all then, October 21st, Danbury Record and CD Expo. I'll have more. I'm promoting it. I'm hosting it. I'll be selling there. On a similar note, Last week, I did a little brief flash card show and tell of these hate breed demos I got, all originals. I was hoping that the original guy who wanted these from me would get in touch. He never did. He's had a week to do so. He has not. So, Amy Lynn Myers, you were the first one to express interest in these. And so I'm giving you first crack at them. I'm giving you fair warning. They ain't cheap. Not only are they not cheap, they're they're expensive. But I got them. If you want to take first crack at them, hit me up. And um, if you don't want them, that's okay. That's perfectly fine because I have three other people in line behind you who um, say they've got the wherewithal and the deep enough pockets to grab some of these original hate breed demos from the 90s. So that kind of brings us up to date there. That's the quickest run through the bulletin board I think I've ever done. A toast to me in my sense of alacrity. <clears throat> Let's check the mailbox, shall we? You already saw the address, but there it is again. P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. Let's see what we got in the mail this week. Oh, boy, I love doing this because, as you just saw by the show and tell I did, um, 
I love records. I like to collect them. I like to hoard them. I like to listen to them. Can you imagine that? I like listening to these. Eric Johnson says that he was just listening to my MT Unwanted Devo tape. Eric, you got fantastic taste. Eric, you also have fantastic taste in cable TV of your own. Why don't you post a link for the good people here so they can check out what you do? Because the people need to know. People need to see original produced content for the people, by the people, of the people. Scott Baldridge. Hello, Scott. Thanks for tuning in. All right, this is a package from Moose Roberts. We've talked about Moose before. Moose is a guy with a guitar and a certain, uh, shall we say, attitude. And he's just sent me a nice envelope, which we are opening now, live before your very eyes. He kind of warned me about what these things are, but man, the verbal is nothing like the visual. Here they are, not one, but two delightful, delectable, delicious hand-lathed records, including this one, which is brand new, if I'm not mistaken. Only 20 made. I got number 15 numbered. Hand-lathed records. I've talked about them a lot here on Tent Talks Tunes. Come back here. Long story short, they're cut by hand in real time. If there's 10 minutes of music on the record, it takes 10 minutes to make. It's not like a pressed record, which is smushed and made out of molten vinyl. These are made out of hard plastic by a craftsman guiding the needle by hand. And they are so cool. Ooh, I've never seen one like this before. Check it out. This one's opaque white and it's got labels. That is groovy. I love that. Little tiny labels too. How cool is that? You can't do that with a pressed record. And it's double-sided. And Moose is a pretty rocking guy with an acoustic guitar. So I'm excited to hear this. Very cool. Moose, if you got any of these and you're watching, let the people know. Tell them where to get some of this good shiz. The people need to know. Hey, Robbie Rob, what's going on? I see that you've just tuned in. Moose Trainwreck Roberts presents Hillbilly Mess. You know what? That's like... One of the most apt self-descriptions ever. Moose tells it like it is, baby. And there he is. The man himself. Let's see what the permutation this takes. Ah, there you go. The classic hand-lathed transparent plastic. It has labels. When I make these things, I never put labels on them. Because I like the complete transparent effect. But they look pretty, pretty darn good with labels, don't they? Moose, thank you very much. You know, I'll be listening to your, uh, shall we say, delicate folk music stylings in the very near future. All right, let's get this thing in here. Now we've got another uh, envelope. This one from the maybe somewhat unlikely location of LaPorte City, Iowa. And it came to me, you know, I love getting mail like this when it arrives in a <clears throat> plastic bag from the U.S. Postal Service telling me, telling me how much they care. Well, if you cared, you wouldn't try to destroy it as hard as you sometimes do. <clears throat> and I can't totally knock the USPS, man. My, um, my experiences with the USPS have been overwhelmingly positive over the years. But we really get a little bit squeamish when we see the envelope in the, the bag telling us how much they care. Whatever, it looks like it's basically intact. I see Michael Pilmer is tuned in. Michael's a man who knows a thing or two about the devotional. Michael, would you care to pay, would you care to post a link to the devotional? I believe that you have just recently posted the full lineup of fine entertainment for devotional. Let the people see. The people need to know. While I'm opening up this envelope, which is not only from Laporte City, Iowa, but is from my pal Gary Forney. I will be releasing some Gary Forney music in the very near future on TPOS. And Gary said, you know what? It would be a great idea to include with each CD or cassette in the initial run a little bonus goodie. And I did some show and tell on Gary's comic book coloring book. And here they are. Not only that, but signed and numbered by Gary Forney himself. These will be coming out with the forthcoming Gary Forney anthology CDs. There's two of them. And if you don't know who Gary Forney is, 
look up Gary Forney along with some of the key words such as outsider, song poem, off the charts. There's a really great movie called Off the Charts about the song poem industry and Gary features prominently in it. And Gary is an artist and a musician that I think people need to know about. So keep your eye on my social media and his for further developments. Very exciting. Okay, next up, a package from Wilmington, North Carolina from Ruined Records. This is another one where I know, I'm pretty sure I know what's in here, but knowing is different from seeing and seeing is different from believing. Let us know, let us see, let us believe. <clears throat> Sealed, the Million Mile Scissors, putting another one foot, another two feet, very carefully now, another three feet, If I do that another 1,700 times, that will put another mile on the Million Mile Scissors. <clears throat> we open the box. We see the packing material. We remove the packing material. And we see that it is indeed a brand new full-length LP by Mad Brother Ward and the Abrasives. Oh yeah. You know it's going to be some pissed off punk rock, baby. Former anti-scene guitar player. Former leader of Mad Brother Ward and the Screaming Street Trash. And now with Mad Brother Ward and the Abrasives. I know a couple of these songs on here, not all of them. But I predict high quality. Apparently this record is very close to being sold out. So if you want yourself some good... No nonsense, no BS, P O D P R, that's pissed off punk rock. Look up Ruined Records, look up Russ Ward, look up Mad Brother Ward, get you some. I'll be playing this too, probably tonight while I brush my cat, who has not made an appearance yet tonight. I don't know where here he is, he's around here somewhere. Todd Jenkins, my old compadre from Florida, says way off subject, but. Are you heading over to Asheville later this month for the Churchill's documentary? Is that happening? Will I be playing there? Well, from what I understand, um, from what I understand, I will be going to Asheville later this month to be interviewed for the upcoming Churchill's documentary, of which there's been at least one. Um, and I'm not playing there. So that's about all I know about that. And I'm still waiting for the producers of the movie to get in touch with me and pick my brain. But yes, another documentary about Churchill's is in the works. And who knows, maybe this one will actually happen. All right. <clears throat> that was the bulletin board. That was the mailbox. I got one other thing to show you guys. One other thing. I was going to do this last week. I neglected to. I mean, I... Just, See, I told you guys I was rushing tonight, so things are a little bit out of order. I will mention that at the devotional, we're going to have the world debut of the vinyl of Devoted. Featuring one side of performances by Gerald V. Casali of Devo. Two songs featuring Bob Lewis, founding member of Devo. And three songs featuring David Kendrick, drummer for Devo for many years. And I'm on four of the songs playing guitar... You've got members of the Spud Boys, the Super Thing, Fantastic Plastics, Devo Maddox, um, Fight Milk. This is like a an all-star potpourri of devoted people making its debut at Devotional, LP, and CD. And of course, at the Anti-Scene 40th Anniversary Show, it's going to be the world debut of the People's Choice album, and I'm going to show you guys something really special. For the past three days, I've been sitting with boxes of records, boxes of album jackets, a rubber stamp, two rubber stamps, and a roll of stickers making these things. And now, you're going to see the official manufacturer of the first two copies of the People's Choice. Live on Facebook, archived on YouTube, cover, 
Orange vinyl, of which there are 135. Orange insert. Insert. Vinyl. Sleeve. Yes, I know I've already made 134 of them, but this is the official, official assembled first copy. It's been sitting on my desk over there for a few weeks waiting for this moment. So even though it's the last, it's really the first. It, it does make sense, I swear. I promise it makes sense. We repeat the process with the blue cover, the blue vinyl, of which 400 were made. I'm sorry, 300. 300 on blue. The blue insert. We make an open-faced sandwich of record. Insert. And then we slice it. Or I should say we stuff the slices into the cover. And there you go, kids. That makes it official. They're all done. The alpha is the omega. The first is the last. You saw it here on Tim Talks Tunes. So come on and get it. Woo! I better drink some water after all that work. Mm, 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 mm. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Yeah, I get so carried away. It's so easy to talk about these things because it's so much fun, you know? That's why I love running a record label and doing what I do, because it's nothing but fun. Can I get an amen from all the people out there? Let's have an amen for being able to do something that you love and pay your bills with it. Pretty darn cool. And actually, one of the, um, I hadn't really thought about it, but that's one of the key reasons that I really hold the Dead Kennedys in such high regard. You know, never mind the music and the records, which we'll be digging into fairly deeply in about a minute. But I remember reading an interview with Jello Biafra many, many years ago, sometime in the 80s. And the interviewer said to Jello Biafra, are you rich? And Biafra said, no, I'm not rich, but uh, I do make a living off of the Dead Kennedys. And I read that and it was just kind of like the clouds parted and the sun shone down. That very simple statement where Jello Biafra said he made a living off of the dead Kennedys. I can't say that that's what made me up and quit my job right then and there and start a record label and, you know, get into bands and all that. But it was the way he just, he stated it so simply and so clearly that he, I make a living off the dead Kennedys. I'm able to pay my bills. I was like, wow, it is that easy. It really is that easy. You don't have to be a rock star. You don't have to be, you know, rich. All you have to do is make your living. That's all you got to do is make your living. And that was a real, real signpost for the teenage Malcolm 10. Maybe I was in my early 20s by then. But you know what I mean? I was young and impressionable and ready to receive good, solid information like that. And that's what, you know, to me, that's what punk rock was always about. You know, the potential, the pursuit of happiness, the fact that you could do it, that there really wasn't anything to constrain you from giving it a shot. If you wanted to make a living off your band, go for it. And if you're like Jella Biafra with a record label and whatever else is happening, it is possible. It is totally possible. So without my really knowing it and without my having really thought about it in a long time, that was actually a very key bit of information from Jella Biafra of the Dead Kennedys that um, served me well. So I might as well hoist the jug yet again and toast a nice piece of advice not even a piece of advice, just a little fact dropped by Jello Biafra. Ah, so how did it all begin? How did it all begin? Well, <clears throat> let's get all the AV here. 
I've talked about it before, growing up as a disaffected youth in the sterile, ugly, sun-baked suburbs of South Florida. You know, I just never fit in with everybody. I never fit in with so-called normal people. Nothing that they did made sense or added up. But I didn't know what I didn't know if there were any alternatives. You know, I didn't know that there was anything beyond the suburbs of Hialeah, Florida, or anything beyond the immediate people in my surroundings until just by chance, on one of the nights I was allowed to stay up late and watch TV, I caught this late night NBC news report on this phenomenon called punk rock. And that was another one of those clouds part and the sun shines down on this young feller. I saw, I had a glimpse of something. And so by long twisted means, I was able to procure a Sex Pistols cassette. And then that led to the Dickies and Devo and then independent record stores and all the life support system that I needed in suburban South Florida. It all started making sense and manifesting itself and coming together. So this is like around 1981 when things were just kind of starting to really crystallize, you know? By 1981, I had acquired my new BFF, my bestie, my best friend forever, Jill Ski. Jill! I don't know if you're out there watching right now, but hey, Jill. I met her in high school. We were kindred spirits immediately, and she made a fateful purchase, most likely at Specs Music in the Westland Mall, because that was the only record store we had access to at the time. <clears throat> She said something along the lines of, you like that, you like punk and hardcore. Here, check this out. I just bought this record. I'll let you borrow it over the Christmas break. And that was my first exposure to the Dead Kennedys. The In God We Trust Incorporated 12-inch single. Now, I'll tell you right off the bat, as a young lad who was raised in the Methodist church... That was quite, quite a piece of artwork. And so I'm already kind of wide-eyed and gobsmacked. Then you turn over the back, and I, I can't tell you, kids, I cannot tell you just how subversive, um, explosive, um, funny. I mean, it was the, the back cover art was just incredible. And then the lyrics, the lyrics, I'm not exaggerating. I was young. I was naive. I didn't know that you were even allowed to write lyrics like this, let alone sing them. This was a far cry from the Bee Gees, Leonard Skinner, Casey and the Sunshine Band, Led Zeppelin, you know, even even the punk rock that I had known up to that point was nothing like this. This was far, far above and beyond anything that had dropped into my wheelhouse up to that point. So <clears throat> I went home uh, quickly, slapped it on the turntable. And was um, kind of confused because it was a weird sounding record. It was really slow and sludgy. And um, the vocals were weird and like really deep pitched. I couldn't understand what was going on. You know, I'm, I'm looking at it. It's like, well, side one's got five songs on it. And side two's got three songs on it. One of them was really long. So it's an album. But it sounds weird. I don't, I don't understand what's going on here. And I might have even tried to play it again and thinking about how weird it sounded. And then finally, it occurred to me to like read the label, the beautifully designed Static Records label on the A side with the alternative tentacles bat on the B, I didn't need glasses by, back then, but let's just say I put on my glasses and 
squinted and um oh 45 rpm oh all right let's try that so i drop it on the turntable switch the speed to 45 put the needle in the groove and That's when I got it. Holy cannoli. I said it before, I'll say it again. I was, you know, familiar with punk rock and all that, but this was just somewhere else. This was like punk rock squared. This was punk rock cubed. I was already exposed to the Dickies, and the Dickies were the fastest thing I'd ever heard in my life. Dead Kennedys faster than the Dickies. And not only that, the music was complex. The songs were well-structured. This was something quite different from your average punk rock, you know? This was skilled musicianship. This was great production. Every instrument was recorded loud and clear and mixed right up front. And yet the vocals still managed to sit on top of all of that without it sounding like a total mess. If you guys know what I'm talking about. It was kind of like the jo like Joe Jackson's first couple of albums, where everything was very clear and very distinct and completely audible, but nothing was in competition with anything else. Beautifully produced by a guy named Geza X. So, yeah. Yeah. It was just like hearing the Dickies for the first time, or Devo for the first time, or the Sex Pistols for the first time. Actually, it was better than that, because those bands each took me like one or two plays to actually get it. Dead Kennedys, first time I played it at the right speed, I got it. And I wanted more, 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 more. I wanted to hear so much more of this. And y'all know me, being the completest that I am, if I want to hear it all, I'm going to take great pains to hear it all. So, you know, gleaning whatever information it was possible to glean, which remember back in the, you know, pre-internet days, it was a lot more difficult. That meant reading whatever magazines were at hand, which, you know, in my day were basically Cream, Trouser Press, Rock Scene, Hit Parader, these magazines, except for Trouser Press, didn't write about stuff like this. And even Trouser Press, fleeting mentions here and there of stuff like that before, you know, punk rock and before hardcore, before American hardcore became more of a force. And of course, the local record stores, if they had imports, so-called imports, they always put the independent labels from the U.S., they always stuck them in the import bin. That always pissed me off. Because how can you put this record, even though this is a French pressing, the first pressings were U.S.? This thing's from California. Why is it in the import bin? What are you, trying to drive me nuts or something? Oi! It's before I realized that the chain record stores got all their imports and their independent releases from the same distributor. So for them, it only made sense for inventorying to just put everything in the import bin. Okay, I get it now. At the time, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Ooh. I'm over it now. So, yeah. The search was on to find more of this Dead Kennedy stuff. And, you know, little by little, bit by bit, I was able to find Dead Kennedy's records here and there. Pretty sure the second one I ever got was Holiday in Cambodia. Backed with Police Truck. And it was kind of the same effect, you know? Hearing this thing for the first time was like yet another bomb going off in my brain and in my ears. It was not as fast and furious and frenetic as In God We Trust Incorporated. But it was still hard-hitting stuff. It was still like, bam, right between the eyes. And hearing songs like that played at a slower tempo, you could really appreciate the musicianship that powered the Dead Kennedys. And everybody 
everybody knows about Jello Biafra and the lyrics and the stage presentation and all that, but man, Klaus Fluoride, East Bay Ray, I'm getting a little bit choked up just thinking about these guys. D.H. Poligro and before him, Bruce Schlesinger, a.k.a. Ted. Those guys, in old-time jazz circles, would have been described as motherfuckers. Because they could play. Those guys could play. And they presented a sonic bed for Biafra to launch himself from that no other band has ever, ever made. Sound was utterly unique. I mean, these guys, you could tell, were like musicians. And, you know, punk rock, which always had this kind of, excuse me, my eyes are really dry today. I don't know why. For punk rock, which always had this undercurrent of, you know, simplicity and DIY and, you know, maybe you're supposed to not be good. It was pretty interesting to hear a band that was good, like willfully, unashamedly, effing good, like serious players. That was another revelation to my young mind, you know? Um, I think this is before, even before I heard Black Flag, I'm pretty sure. So I wasn't used to that kind of overt skill on the bass, drums, and guitar, let alone the stuff that Biafra was singing about, you know? I mean, this is some uh, heady stew, kids. So, you know, shortly there, uh, shortly thereafter, you know, I was able to track down a copy of California Uberales, backed with Man with the Dogs. I think Man with the Dogs is the better of the two songs, just saying. I think that the version of California Uberales, which is entitled We've Got a Bigger Problem Now, that appears on this is the better of the two versions with the loungy sort of faux cocktail music arrangement. And then it kicks into the punk rock part. That's killer. This one is good. It's just not that good. Man with the Dogs kicks serious butt, though. It's got that East Bay Ray Echoplex guitar. Oh, man. Trademark. Timeless. Mike Lesser says that East Bay Ray was a jazz player. I did not know that, but I'm not surprised. Not surprised at all. So it was really just... Um, a matter of waiting with bated breath as I heard the word that a new Dead Kennedys album was coming out. And um, it wasn't exactly like I was camping out at the record store, but I was definitely keeping an eye on things for the second Dead Kennedys album, Plastic Surgery Disasters, which in my opinion is a masterpiece. This is the Dead Kennedys high watermark right here. Musically, topically, lyrically. For some strange reason, I don't have the vinyl anymore. I, you know, I've, I've bemoaned many times the fact that as, year, as the years have gone by, and if I ever needed to pay some bills or needed some dough, the personal collection was always mineable, shall we say. I could always mine the personal collection and pick out some things here and there, you know, to, to raise some bucks. Happened a lot in the brick and mortar years. In the brick and mortar years, my personal record collection was basically just an extension of the store inventory. And it's, it's pretty much still the same way now. You know, like if push really came to shove, I would sell any of these, you know, cause you gotta, you gotta keep, gotta keep living, you know? But, um, Luckily, not as much as it used to be back then. My overhead, once the landlord tossed us out unceremoniously, my overhead went down by about 90% after the store closed. And that's that makes things a lot easier. Of course, my income went down a similar amount, but it seems like the, the, the amount in has so far netted out to being just a little bit more than the amount going out, which does make things a hell of a lot easier. A hell of a lot easier. Anyway, I digress. I had to sell the vinyl at some point, but I do have a copy of the CD. Jesus Louise, this album kicks ass on every front. The original booklet with that incomparable Winston Smith collage art. I soaked this stuff up like a dry sponge. Man, this stuff is good. This is so good. 
looks even better in 12 by 12 format. Yeah, Plastic Surgery Disasters. Hardly a bad song on there. <clears throat> the one exception, I think, being Winnebago Warrior. That one's kind of filler, you know, and why they had the need to make fun of people driving Winnebagos, I don't know. I always I always wanted a Winnebago when I was a kid. I kind of still I kind of still do want a Winnebago. I think mobile homes are cool, baby. Little tiny sinks and little itty bitty refrigerators and little tiny beds and you drive around in them and they're neat. Winnebagos are neat. I would be a Winnebago warrior. No problem. So y'all can just leave that song off the album. Not necessary. But everything else? Woo! And the way that all the songs on side one were like all the really fast hardcore songs, so to speak. They're not really hardcore. They're just really, really fast, well-crafted punk rock songs. They put all the short, fast ones on side one and the slower... I don't want to say experimental, but like just the slower, more experimental ones that push the envelope a little bit more, they put all those on side two. And it, that was a perfect way of doing it. That really made a lot of sense. And um, the crowning song of the album, Moon Over Marin. Oh, what a great song. Great song. Awesome song. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I'll kind of say, too, the only... Oh, only other slight dip is that they recut the song Bleed for me. They had released it as a single somewhere, you know, somewhat before they released the album. I think the single version of Bleed for me is better than the album version. And I also think that the B side on the Bleed for me Life Sentence would have made a better end to side A than Winnebago Warrior. That's just my opinion. That's the record geek stuff. That's the music fan stuff that we love so much. Talking about the Dead Kennedys. The switchboard is lighting up here. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. John Provenzano mentions that the best part about the In God We Trust Incorporated cassette was that side two of the cassette was deliberately left blank. They put all the music on side one and left side two blank. This was in the days of home taping is killing music campaign which was shoved down our throats by the major labels. And we already know how much I love the major labels. The major labels can sit on as many of these as humanly possible. Just not mine, because I don't want to get that slime and that swill over my clean middle finger. Mm -mm, don't want it. Nope. F that. So Plastic Surgery Disasters makes me a raving Dead Kennedys fanatic. And I gotta get it all. So, you know, I ended up picking up the great Nazi Punk's Fuck Off single packaged in a transparent bag with an armband. Classic anti-Nazi logo. Another logo that never got as much traction as the anti-Nazi logo. But there it is. This came out on the Subterranean label out of San Francisco. And I always respected Subterranean for keeping the list price on this record really cheap. They couldn't keep it in print all the time, but whenever they had it in whenever they had it available and in print, the price was always low. Always respected that. Great. So tracking down the singles, and then imagine my surprise when I went to the great Yesterday and Today records in South Miami and saw this mysterious item. What the H is this? Recorded, by the way, September 13th, 1982, exactly 41 years ago today. Boy, I love these historical synchronicities. Love them. I said, Rich, Yoloha. Rich, the guy behind the counter at Yesterday and Today. What is this? He said, it's a live album. I said, I'll take it. Plunked down my 898 and... Proceeded to just about wear out the grooves on the skateboard party. An authentic document of the Dead Kennedys' live experience on the Starving Missile label. And um, I read an interview with, once again, Biafra, because he did like 99.9% .9 of the talking for the Dead Kennedys. 
<clears throat> he said that this was like a gray, a gray area semi-official boot. Apparently the guy from Starving Missile asked the permission to press this. <clears throat> and uh, Biafra slash Dead Kennedy said, yeah, go ahead and do it, but don't press any more than whatever amount. And apparently the guy pressed a lot more than that amount, as it happens in this business. But I'm kind of glad he did, because it's a red-hot document of probably the dead Kennedys at their peak, live. Maybe. Maybe not. Because the performance is kind of sloppy. And, uh, you know, listening to this album with unsophisticated ears, I, I never really noticed just how sloppy it was. But um, this was right around the time when the dead Kennedys started to embrace hardcore. And started to embrace the hardcore audience and to start playing songs straight across the board at breakneck hardcore tempos. And I think the problem with doing that was that their stuff was so complex and so nuanced and so faceted that it didn't really translate too well to being played that fast. You can almost hear like Klaus Floyd and East Bay Ray, you can hear their fingers are getting tangled up trying to play these complex songs at such incredibly ridiculous breakneck speeds. And even Biafra, motor mouth that he is, a lot, oftentimes has trouble keeping up with delivering these streams of lyrics at such a rapid tempo. So the sound is starting to get a little bit cluttered, you know? I think the only guy who doesn't come off... <laughs> as a slob is D.H. Peligro, because he could play the songs on the drums that fast. And it's like the other guys were trying to keep up with him. So it was a real sort of uh, game of chase going on. And at the end of the day, the music kind of suffered for it, because it wasn't meant to be played that fast. Having said that, it's really exciting. It's got lots of stage banter, lots of Biafra's spieling, and the electric live atmosphere, it's a great quality recording. I can listen to this one right now and get enjoyment out of it. As sloppy as it is, it's still just a really exciting document of what the Dead Kennedys were like. 41 years ago today. Check it out, guys. Ooh. And uh, Brandon Yitai. Anti-Scenes, um, as Walt Wheat describes, Anti-Scenes Human Forklift, Brandon Yitai, has just chimed in and says, um, let me make sure I read it correctly here, maybe sloppy and a bit too fast, but I'll bet the show is more intense for the crowd. No doubt, I'm sure it was exciting as hell. And it sounds like it was exciting as hell. Can you imagine having been there at the time to witness this? Pretty cool, man. So, yeah, we're looking for Dead Kennedy's records, and eventually I knuckle down and get a copy of Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables. Check that out, gang. First pressing with the orange cover. And a hype sticker somewhere. There it is. Hype sticker. And the original shrink wrap. I'm a record collector. I love this stuff. So hearing this, yet another... Revelation. It was kind of like hearing Holiday in Cambodia for the first time. Yes, it's my beloved Dead Kennedys, but playing at much slower tempos for the most part. And that's when you can really hear the band shine. To this day, I think Plastic Surgery Disasters is a better album overall. This is still a damn good album. And I can only imagine what it was like when this album first came out and being able to hear this for the first time in amongst all of your, the germs and, uh, you know, the damned and, you know, like whatever else was current in 1979, early 1980, this must've been something else, really something else. Forward to death. Wow. What a song. So yeah, great album, but I think plastic surgery, is a better album. More developed, more finely coalesced, more fine-tuned. And also big props to Bruce Schlesinger, a.k.a. Ted, for being a hell of a drummer. Not as hard of a hitter as D.H. Peligro, and not as much to push the tempos as D.H., but a guy who really played some tasty 
thought out drum parts. The guy was not just a timekeeper. He played parts that matched the songs. Brilliant. Brilliant. So time marches on. The Dead Kennedys march on. The Danbury Tap is downed. Uh, Vaughn, none of your damn business, asks if I ever heard the Cold Fish demo. Yes, I have. I got the 7-inch single when it came out as a bootleg way back when. And it was pretty cool at the time because unreleased Dead Kennedy songs were very thin on the ground. And that actually leads me to a, a side topic. If you guys want to just hold on for one second, in the true spirit of cable TV, I'm going to disappear for a minute. I'm not going away. Um, I will reach down, and I wish you guys could see, well, in my absence, good old Harry has made an appearance. We were waiting for him to show up. There he is. I would prop him up in a spot where you guys could look at him during my very brief absence, but he's, uh, he's too low to be seen by the camera. Y'all will just have to listen to the sound of his contented purring while I step two feet over that away. Okay, just hang on a second, guys. Entertain him, fella. Entertain him. Okay, now you're in my seat. You gotta go. Go! As I said before, like, once I get into a band, I want to hear it all. And that's why, you know, and that's why I just love the very existence of the thing they call the bootleg. Live recordings, studio outtakes, radio interviews, radio shows, all that stuff. So when I, want, when I say I want to hear everything by the Dead Kennedys, I want to hear it all. You see what that is? That is a stack of Dead Kennedys live CDs. This isn't even all of them. This is most of them. Dead Kennedys, kids. That's how serious I am about the Dead Kennedys. And I know a lot of tapers and tape traders and collectors who will get a show just to have it. In the cassette days, I would get a lot of tapes that guys would trade in, and you could tell they don't, they'd only listen to like the first minute or so of every single tape in their collection. I've listened to every dang one of these from start to finish. You want to know how geeky I am about it? <clears throat> how geeky and freaky I am about it? Every one of them has notes about the performance, about the song selection. Everything. I've always had it in the back of my mind to write a book about these. It's going to be called Dead Kennedys as Performance Artists or something like that. But when am I ever going to sit down and write a book? You know, that's kind of why I do Temp Talks tunes. I'm able to spiel this stuff live, on site, for the permanent record. What do you think? Maybe someday I should just sit down with all my Dead Kennedy CDs and read you the notes? That's almost as good as a book. Here, I'll read you some notes right here. Here's a note. This is, a, this is my notes about the SO36 Club recording from December 10th, 1982. Berlin, very tight and energetic, even on tunes played double quick. Plastic surgery, plastic surgery disasters announced as being out any day. Nazi punks fuck off messed up. Ray never seems to know how to do that one. Minimal blab between songs. Complete set. Widely available on cassette at stores in the early 80s, which is true. Somebody made a, um, oh, let's see, Matt Milliken wants me to re read it in a Jello Biafra accent? Okay. Very intense and energetic. Even on tunes played double quick. Plastic surgery disasters is due out any day. Nazi punks fuck off is messed up. Ray never seems to know how to do that one. Minimal blab between songs? Is this the complete set? Is this the complete set? 
This is widely available on cassette in stores in the early 80s, even though it's a bootleg. How'd I do, guys? What do you think, a whole show of me reading Dead Kennedy's notes in a Jello Biafra voice? If you vote for it, I'll do it. Anyway, that's how insane in the membrane I am, how loco and el coco I am for this Dead Kennedy stuff. And if you think that's something, you should see my Black Flag collection, or God forbid, my Devo collection. Oh, man. We'd need a two-parter. Anyway, time marches on. Time for a new Dead Kennedys record. And that record is, of course... Franken-Christ. Franken-Christ. Yep, you guessed it. Another one with the shrink. Hype sticker. Vinyl. Printed inner sleeve. And wouldn't you know it, yes, the infamous poster for which the Dead Kennedys got in much trouble. And this one is kind of stuck together. I don't want to... I'll just kind of give you a quick flash of it. It's kind of stuck together, but the original poster, which resulted in a lot of trouble for the dead Kennedys. Greg, Greg Geevers asks, did they raid Jello's apartment for that? Yes, they did. And you can read the whole sordid tale about it online, I'm sure. The result was miles and miles and miles of newspaper coverage. So what do I think about Frankenchrist? I like it plenty well enough. This is the one where, at least on vinyl, they finally put the brakes on it a little bit and went back to slower tempos. And side one on this album, I think, is Stone Cold Classic. There's not a wasted groove on side one. Oh, and by the way, relating to what I said about my personal collection when I had my brick and mortar store being an extension of the inventory, I tried to sell this record once. You can see for 35 bucks, nobody bought it. Then I was going to put it on eBay, minimum bid of five bucks with a $25 reserve. Nobody bought it. And that included with it, that included a letter from Biafra. Handwritten letter from Biafra on AT stationery. Nobody wanted to pay 35 bucks for it back in the day. I wonder if they would now. Anyway, side one, awesome. They really hit it on side one. By side two, in my opinion, it starts to get kind of samey. The tempos don't vary too much. And lyrically, I don't know, the sense of humor is starting to ebb. The bitterness is starting to creep in. And... Um, I think some of the songs are a little too willfully experimental. Jockarama being a great example of that. Um, Saturday Night Holocaust was another good example of that. I think the songs just kind of meander. Yeah, there are a lot of parts. Yeah, they fit together. But do you, do you really need all those parts? Do you really need that much of a song? That was kind of my critique of the direction that the Dead Kennedys went on this album. So, yeah, side one was great. By side two, the joke is starting to wear thin a little bit. A little bit. Like, to this day, I, I never, ever listen to the songs on side two. Because uh, it just does not stand up. Let's see what's on side two, anyway. Besides Jockarama. What do we got on side two here in this impossible-to-read small type Oh, wow, they misprinted it. They misprinted it as Macho-Rama. That's interesting. I wonder if that's, uh, that's a variant I never even noticed before. Misprinted as Macho-Rama. It's supposed to be Jocko-Rama. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. If I ever do try to sell it, I will have to double the price because of that. Um, at my job, that one's okay. MTV Get Off the Air. 
Yeah, whatever. I think it's a crowd favorite. I don't really care for it that much. Um, Stars and Stripes of Corruption. Same deal. I think they were just trying too hard on that one. Just trying a little bit too hard. And what's the other song on there? Oh, Goons of Hazard. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. But yeah, too much bitterness, too much anger, not enough humor. And the songs are starting to kind of go like that. And plus, by listening to the many, many, many live recordings from, 18, from 1985 on the Frankenchrist tour, that's when Jello Biafra, <clears throat> and pardon me while I drink for a second here, I read an interview with, I think, Klaus Floride, who made mention of the fact that, in his opinion, Jello Biafra embraced the hardcore movement and tried to turn the Dead Kennedys into a hardcore band. And as I think about it, and this only really came to me recently, it seems to me, this is my opinion, that I think I finally understand what Biafra meant, or what Klaus Floride meant by what he said about Biafra embracing the hardcore movement. It kind of seems to me that Jello Biafra really thought that the hardcore kids could actually be a genuine force for like immediate widespread social change. It would appear to me that he really thought that he could start a social revolution using the hardcore kids and playing music that was hardcore, that he could have these people at a hardcore show and teach them some things, which, you know, certainly a noble idea, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but not at the expense of the music and the performance. And I think that's where the, you sort of came to cross purposes with those two things. It's one thing to try to create a social movement, but something else to try to create it at a concert at a punk rock concert, when people are, at the end of the day, they are there to dance, sing along, stage dive, have a good time. So when you play a song, and the crowd's going ape wire, and then you stop and harangue them for a few minutes, it doesn't work. You know, it really kills the momentum of the concert and takes all the wind out of the sails of the performance. And there's at least one of these live recordings I've got where Biafra has been going on all night. And at one point, Klaus Floyd says, do you guys, did you come here? Did you want to come here for a punk rock show or for a lecture? Something to that degree. I'm not quoting him exactly, but Klaus Floyd is just like, do you want to hear music or do you want to hear this guy talk kind of thing? And um, I thought that was a very interesting glimpse into the dynamics of the band at the time because Biafra wanted to do this but the other guys probably just wanted to play music. And I think that subsequent developments kind of support that. They are musicians. They wanted to play music. And the fact that all three of them were absolutely 100% silent during the Frankenchrist trial era, not one of those guys ever said one word on the issue that I ever saw. Maybe I'm wrong. I never saw one single comment from East Bay Ray, Klaus Floride, or D.H. Peligro about the whole mess. Am I reading too much into that? I don't know. But that's just, uh, again, I think kind of interesting. And so they survive that and they get to um, Bedtime for Democracy. And I posted about this recently. I posted a YouTube clip of uh, the last song on side one, which is Cesspools in Eden, which is Chill City, Goosebump Central. Easily one of the best songs in the entire Dead Kennedys songbook, which unfortunately, like a pearl dropped into the pig pen, is... I'm going to go ahead and say it. Hope you guys are ready for this. And I know that there's going to be plenty of people who disagree with that. Dude, please. If you're going to post your comments, okay? Because if you're going to disagree with this, and I'm genuinely curious, I want to know why. 
I want to know what it is that makes you think that Bedtime, Demo that Bedtime for Democracy is a good album. In my opinion, it's a weak album. In fact, I'm really going to go ahead and say it. I think this album... Are you ready? Are you guys ready for my opinion of Bedtime for Democracy? I better take another drink. Better remove my gum in case I end up choking. Hold on for one second. Okay, the gum is out. Okay, I'm hydrated. I got my gum out. I've invited the uh, opposing viewpoint. Now I'm going to say this album sucks. Album sucks. Sorry, guys. It sucks. It just flat out sucks. It sucks. It suffers from excessive hardcore damage. It's got those... 80s shotgun in an oil tank drum sound. The tempos are forced. Pretty much all the humor is gone. Like everything that anything that passes for humor is really just bitter and angry and negative. You know, it's just this is not a fun record at all, even in like even songs like, you know, a telethon, you know, which is not even a song which are supposed to be funny, just come off as bitter. It's just so much bitterness in this record. And I can, you know, I can kind of see why, you know, the whole Frank and Christ thing had just gone down and, you know, dead Kennedys are being blackmailed, blackballed and put on watch lists and all that. And I'd, I'd be pre pretty angry and pissed off myself, too. And so... I guess artistically, it's definitely a valid reflection of what was going on at the time with the band. But musically, I think this is Biafra attempting once again to embrace the hardcore crowd and put out a record that was hardcore. And the Dead Kennedys were not a hardcore band. I might go so far as to say that they weren't even a punk rock band. You know, they were just a a band that played really tasty, well put together rock music really fast. And you got to remember that Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables, this was some very fast stuff in 1979, 1980. And like I said, with In God We Trust Incorporated, that was just beyond belief fast. But they pulled it off a lot better with In God We Trust Incorporated. And really the main thing is the production on this album does not help it. It's just the wrong combination of slick. Not even a combination, it's just slick. It's slick and it's not particularly well done. So the production always bugged me about this one. The lack of humor, the breakneck tempos when they weren't really appropriate. You know, I, I really often wonder if this album could have been rejiggered, kind of like Cut the Crap by The Clash, which I've talked about a lot lousy effing record, but there's these glimmers of excellence in there. And with a different approach, with different production, different tempos, maybe some different lyrics, I think this really could have been, in my opinion, a classic Dead Kennedys record, but they, it just really misfires. I think it's just cynical and forced and angry, and that's why I don't like Bedtime for Democracy. But man, Cesspools and Eden, what a hell of a song. And their version of Take This Job and Shove It is pretty cool, too. That, should, that could have been the A-side. Cesspools and Eden could have been the B-side, and they could have just thrown the rest of it away. Or put it aside for a serious rework, maybe a year or two later. That's just my opinion. I'd like to thank you guys for tuning in and listening to my opinion. And I, of course, love reading your opinions as they appear in the comment section, so feel free. This guy's opinion is that he loves a good chin rub. I have never met a cat who didn't like getting a good chin rub. <laughs> That's Harry the Cat, guys. The scene stealer every time. So, yep, yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoy doing this uh, to you, with you, for you, and at you. I do expect to be back in about 167 hours' time. 
Until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent. And of course, Harry the Cat saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>